Matthew chapter 16. I'm glad there are people who know more about that technology than I do. Uh, evening. I'll take them one at a time. The Lord has shown us wonderful things throughout the day. And we have this in Scripture too. How do we carry on after the Lord shows us things? You know, in Matthew 16, the... Jesus comes into the region of Caesarea Philippi in verse 13 and asks the question, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said some say John, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? We've had this in Luke also. Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ? the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. I don't want to go into the details of this. I would like to leave room for others. So the question that the Lord asked the disciples not only what do men say that I, the Son of Man, am, but who do you say that I am? And Peter gives an excellent answer. The Lord tells him he's been blessed. Peter has said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I don't want to go into the rest of that particular portion. But I want to go on in verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. The Father had revealed to Peter, that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now Peter is going to be tested. Do you really believe this? We make confession of many things. We say we believe this, we believe that, and so on. Do we really believe it? The Lord has been speaking, now he begins to speak of the death that he's going to have to suffer. You know, the disciples had the idea, and they based it on Old Testament scripture. You know, there are scriptures that we enjoy, and there are scriptures that we don't pay much attention to. Most people know the 23rd Psalm, and they know John 3.16, and so on, but there are many scriptures that are a bit of a jungle to us, you know. And when the Lord spoke of suffering, and they were expecting him to set up his throne, why, this was a shock, I'm sure. And Peter's very polite. He takes the Lord aside. Lord, I've got to, I've got to say something to you. 
to think. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you. Lord, this shall not happen to you. Well, if we had been one of the disciples, would we have liked this announcement that the Lord was going to suffer? We probably wouldn't either. Peter loves the Lord, but he doesn't realize what is involved in the confession that he has made. In effect, he is denying what he had just confessed. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. Because God spoke of the Messiah and uh, he spoke of him in Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Many other scriptures that spoke of the suffering of the Lord. Oh, Lord. He says, far be it from you, Lord. This shall not happen to you. I'm so glad that Peter's apparently solicitous care for the Lord didn't go through. The Lord rebuked him. He turned to Peter. He said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You know, if there's one thing Satan would want to prevent, it would be the Lord dying on the cross for our sins. Satan did not want to be defeated. The pre prophecy that God had given in the very beginning was that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent, but the serpent would crush his heel. The Lord would have to die in order to win the victory over Satan. We could not have a savior if the Lord Jesus would not have died. Peter had just confessed him to be the Christ. And now he's saying, no, you can't do that. And the Lord says, that idea comes from Satan. In fact, he speaks to Peter. Get thee behind me, Satan. And I don't think the Lord meant to call Peter a devil in any way. But I think he, he makes it very plain that the idea that Jesus would not have to die for our sins, it was a satanic idea. And you know, people today, it was mentioned in the Bible reading, perhaps at the table. People want to talk about the Lord as a great prophet, as a good teacher, as a moral man, a, a great leader, so on and so forth. But to talk about him dying on the cross for our sins, that's another matter. And I've heard people say they don't want this bloody religion. And so, well, that idea comes from below, not from above. The Lord says, you're an offense to me, for you're not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. Okay, strike one. And the Lord says to his disciples here, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? 
for the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, we've had much of this and during the day today. I don't want to comment further on these things because I would like to speak about Peter and the confession he made and the testing that he ran into. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered. Oh, that in itself is not a polite thing to do. They're talking with the Lord, and Peter feels he has to get a word in there. He wakes up. Peter is quick to talk anyway. But Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. The Lord had patiently gone on with Peter after what we had in chapter 16. Even taking Peter up on the mountain with him. James and John also. And they got to see something very, very special. We've talked about it during the day. The Lord was transfigured before them. Peter has fallen asleep. We can understand climbing a mountain isn't the easiest thing. He's awakened. Moses and Elijah. Oh, my. Lord, I've got a suggestion. Lord, it's good for us to be here. That's what my teachers in school called a platitude. You know, it's a statement that's absolutely true, but absolutely unnecessary, too. And it's good for us to be here. If you wish, he's very polite about it. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Well, first Peter has brought the Lord down from the confession, you are the Christ. Now, he's put, making the Lord the first of the prophets. You and Moses and Elijah built three tabernacles here. Well, while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. We have this bright cloud in the Old Testament at various times. Filled the tabernacle when it was dedicated. Filled the temple when it was dedicated. We find various times that Jehovah, God, spoke to Moses out of the cloud. The cloud is, is really a symbol of his presence. And in the Old Testament, as a normal thing, he was hidden from the people. He was at a distance. You know, now we have access into the very presence of God. We can go boldly into the holiest. At one time, the high priest could only go into the holiest on one day in the year. He actually went in twice on that day. If he survived the first time, going in with the sacrifice for his own sins, the blood of the bullock, then he could go in the second time with the blood of the goat for the sins of the people. But all on only one day, we have access into the presence of God at all times. There's no time when we can't pray. God the Father speaks this time. The Lord Jesus has spoken to Peter. And now there's suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son 
in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. We don't have to make suggestions to the Lord. Oh, Peter, you know, big project. Make three tabernacles here. We'll just stay here. It's so nice. You know, after a little while at the conference, it's kind of nice to stay here, isn't it? We get to enjoy hearing about our Lord Jesus. We get good meals. We have nice fellowship with fellow Christians. We're really apart from the world for a while. But it's wonderful. Let's just stay here. Life doesn't work that way. One of these days, we're going to be with the Lord. That is, everyone who knows the Lord as his or her personal Savior. We're going to be with the Lord, and we will stay there with him. And anything he tells us, let's do this or let's go there or anything of that sort, there'll be no hesitation. We'll be glad to do it. And it won't be difficult. It won't cost us anything. He'll make it all possible. It's going to be wonderful. But now, God the Father says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. It's good for us to hear him. To do what he says. Not to try to twist his arm to do what we say. When the disciples heard it, a voice out of the cloud, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and do not be afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Well, that's what God the Father wanted them to see. Who he wanted them to see. No one but Jesus only. They couldn't make a mistake. They wouldn't have to listen to Moses anymore. Wouldn't have to listen to Elijah anymore. But Jesus, they were to hear him. Now, Peter had denied the other part of his confession. In a way, here, you are, he had said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And to think he had put him on a level with the prophets. Honored prophets, two of the greatest prophets, Moses and Elijah. But the Lord is greater than any one of the prophets or anyone else. Well, I'm going to pass over some things here in this chapter and we'll go to the latter part of the chapter. Again in verse 22, Now while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And the third day he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. Well, I would say this was good for them. They should be sorrowful. We should be sorrowful too. When we think of what it cost the Lord to procure our salvation, what he suffered, you know, our hearts can be filled with sorrow and with joy at the same time. Thankful that he's done all that for us. But oh, how sad that our sins took him to the cross at Calvary. But now, something else. When they had come to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the temple tax? He said, Yes. And when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes? From their sons or from strangers? Peter said to him, from strangers. Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. 
Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes up first. And when you have opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me and you. Well, what's this? The Jews in the time of Nehemiah had agreed they would each pay, I believe it was a third of a shekel per year, to support the sacrifices and the work that was done in the temple. Somebody had to bring wood, you know, people don't always bring everything free. There were a lot of things that had to be bought, no doubt. And inflation had taken place. Now it was a little more. And the tax collectors are coming. These are not the government tax collectors from the Roman government. These are the tax collectors who are collecting the temple taxes. And every good Jewish man had promised years before to pay so much per year. And they asked Peter, does your teacher not pay the temple tax? Evidently he hadn't paid it at this time. Doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Oh, Peter says, yes, he does. He's a good Jew. And that's bringing the Lord down still further. Now he's not comparing him with Moses and Elijah. He's saying, oh, my, my master, my teacher is a good Jew. Well, he owes taxes to support God's work in the temple. And you know, when Peter comes in, just picture him running in, Lord, temple taxers, uh, tax collectors are outside the door. And they say, you haven't paid your taxes yet. Uh, Lord, can, can we give them taxes? After all, we're good Jews, aren't we? Before Peter could say anything. You know, Peter was usually pretty quick to speak. But it says here that when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him. Jesus got in the first word. Jesus said to Peter, what do you think, Simon? Calls him by his natural name, Simon. From whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes? From their sons or from strangers? From their people? Oh, Peter says, the king doesn't make the prince or the princess. He doesn't make his children pay taxes. Well, the royal family is supported by the taxes of the people. And we still have kings and queens in this world. In fact, we have some brethren who live under a queen. And uh, I don't know how much of the tax money she gets, but I understand she's a very wealthy lady. Well, Peter says, or the Lord says to Peter, do the kings of the earth take customs or, you know, customs is what you would pay when you bring something into the country. Uh, they charge a tax on that. They call that customs or duty. And then taxes, income tax we pay and so on. Well, do they do, take that from their sons or from strangers? Oh, Peter says, that's obvious from strangers. Huh. And then Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. I don't know what Prince Harry and Prince William pay per year. Maybe they have to pay something as being subjects, but I would think that they get quite a salary from the government. Would that be right, Mark? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. The sons are free. And the Lord says, we don't want to give them offense. Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, 
cast in a hook. Now, I've heard brethren speak on this verse. I've heard brethren give messages on fishing for the Lord. I will make you fishers of men. And I've heard them speak about how careful we have to be to use the right kind of bait. Scripture never speaks about bait in connection with fishing. And here we have, I think, the only, or at least one of the only references to fishing with a hook. Cast in a hook and take the fish that comes up first, the Lord says. And when you've opened its mouth, you'll find a piece of money, a piece of silver. And that would be enough for two people. And the Lord says, take that and give it to them for me and you. Really, the Lord didn't have to pay temple tax. It was his father that they claimed to be worshiping. And they really claimed to be worshiping Jehovah. And God is a trinity. So really, the Lord Jesus should have been getting their worship. But he was here as a man upon earth, so he wasn't claiming their worship in the temple. But he says, give that to them for me. I'm going to give it. And for you, you owe it. But really, he's bringing Peter up to his level. And you know, the Lord Jesus has made us sons of God. And he, after his resurrection, the Lord Jesus told Mary Magdalene, Go to my brethren and say, I ascend to my father and your father, to my God and your God. To think that the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who was so jealous for his glory, is now our father. And he's the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's our God too. What beautiful thing. What a rebuke to Peter. And what a lovely way the Lord uses to give that rebuke. He doesn't say, Peter, don't you know better than this? After all, last week you confessed thus and so. No, he, he doesn't scold him. But my, he shows him that he is the son of the living God. Why, who could command a fish who had seen something bright sparkling in the water and had tried to swallow it, uh, got stuck in his mouth, couldn't go down his throat, who could command that very fish to bite on Peter's hook? He doesn't say throw your net in and sell the fish that you catch. No, one fish was enough. That fish would have enough money in its mouth to pay for two people. And the Lord says that we don't offend them. He wasn't here to cause offense. He didn't raise his voice in the street. The Lord never led demonstrations and so on. Isn't it beautiful to see who he is, the son of the living God? He can command the right fish to bite on Peter's empty hook. At least we have no record that Peter had to put any bait on it. The Lord just said, throw your hook in. First fish that bites, bring them in. That's enough. Well, Peter was quicker to act than to think. And I believe oftentimes, I at least, am quicker to act than to think a thing through. We make confessions. Are we living up to our confession? One other scripture in Matthew. I want you to turn to Matthew. And let me just see the chapter. I think it's chapter 26. Yes. In chapter 26, we find in verse 47, while he, the Lord Jesus, was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. 
Now his betrayer had given them a sign saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one sees him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Judas betrays the Lord. And they take the Lord. They bind him. Peter is one who's trying to defend the Lord. He's got a sword. What's he doing with a sword? It's way late at night. He chops at this man that's coming at the Lord. I expect he meant to split his skull, but chopped off his ear. And the Lord picks up the ear. The last thing he does before they tie his hands is to put that ear back in place. Beautiful to see that, isn't it? But then at the end of verse 56, we find that all the disciples forsook him and fled. And then those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard. And he went in and sat with the servants, the servants to see the end. John's gospel tells us that John was already there. And John spoke to the girl at the gate. This is after midnight at night. Let Peter, my friend, come in. And she let him in. And they're quizzing, questioning the Lord. And he is confessing that good confession already before the high priest, later on before Pilate. Verse 69, now Peter sat outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him saying, you also were with Jesus of Galilee. Oh, she had let him in. She, the high priest's people knew John, and John had said, please let him in. You also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you're saying. And when he had gone out to the gate, way, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, this fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, he denied with an oath. I do not know the man. He said a bad word, you know, kids. An oath is a bad word. I do not know the man. The man. He's not even a good Jew anymore. He's the man that the soldiers are torturing. And they're trying to get rid of him. I don't know the man. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely you are one of them. You also are one of them. For your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately, a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word of the Jesus who had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. Other scripture tells us that the Lord looked at him. Peter caught that look. Thank God, Peter was immediately sorry. But think of that disciple who had said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, denying him with curses and oaths. Terrible thing. You know, all of us are human beings, just like Peter was. All of us have the nature that we were born with. Thank God. Most of us have accepted the Lord Jesus as our Savior and Lord. And we also have a new nature, which does not sin, cannot sin, hates sin, but the old nature is still there. And sometimes we, we might do something, we might slip and do something that is absolutely terrible. You know, if we would go on with the story of Peter, he went out, he wept bitterly. And when the Lord Jesus rose from the dead, three days 
after his crucifixion, the first person he appeared to was Mary Magdalene. But the first man he appeared to was Peter. And the Lord went to Peter because that night when the disciples came back from Emmaus where they had been going and the Lord had walked with them, had come into their house for supper, broken the bread, and then they had recognized him. And they ran back all the way to Jerusalem. And when they got there, the disciples were all together, except for Thomas, you know. And they were saying, the Lord has risen indeed. He's appeared to Peter. They hadn't believed the women who told them in the morning that the Lord had risen. But the fact that the Lord had gone to Peter and had privately restored him. And then in John 21, we have the public restoration of Peter. And a man like Peter, when he was restored, the Lord had said, I've prayed for you. And when you're restored, when you're converted, strengthen your brethren. The Lord gave him responsibility. When the Holy Spirit came down in Acts 2, it was Peter that stood up with the eleven and preached the gospel. God has made him, this Jesus, whom you put to death. God has made him both Lord and Christ. And a little bit later he says that there is no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. It's only through him. Peter learned his lesson. We have our ups and downs too. And I'm not advocating any downs for us. We certainly would want to be faithful to the Lord. But we don't want to question what God says in his word. And we want to remember that even when we are unfaithful, the Lord remains faithful. He cannot deny himself.